Inside the X is a short newsletter every Friday designed to give you some fun right before the weekend. It'll include links to blog posts, articles, books, quotes, and recent purchases I've made. Everything is handpicked to add value to your life. To join, email entertainmentxpodcast at gmail.com. Good morning, Vietnam! But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond! Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I sit down with J.J. Neiman. J.J. is the male swing for Book of Mormon on Broadway. We talk about his journey to getting the role, how quickly he's gotten the role, how he keeps himself fresh after having the role of swinging for a number of years now. We also cover on cover different topics, including uh, Instagram, actually staying uh, authentic, and how you can kind of tell when something is not, among many other odds and ends that I just, uh, it was fascinating. The conversation took t- twists and turns that I did not expect it to take. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did having the conversation with JJ. Enjoy. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe, and today with me is JJ Neiman. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> JJ, thank you for joining me on this big comfy couch <laughs> <laughs> as we chat about your life and your career etc etc we became friends through multiple really um fellow college graduates where you went to college mm-hmm. right? elon mm-hmm. university yes we're gonna talk about that we're gonna talk about the beginning of your career book of mormon yes and so much more <laughs> let's start all the way at the beginning as per mm-hmm. most of these episodes mm-hmm. eight years old what yes. happened in that year of life well even before <laughs> then so it's actually very funny my parents had a um they had their own theater company for kids um and that was called hosanna players where um in annapolis maryland so that's where i was born um and raised for the first nine ten years of my life and so um they had this theater company that put up all these like biblical stories basically and like lessons for kids and um they were like really cute shows um and so all my sisters were in those and my sisters are six eight and ten years older than me so I literally there's pictures of me like in the crib in the playpen like in the churches that they were putting on these shows at like in rehearsals and I was like singing along before I even like could speak words and like dancing and so I really feel like growing up in a theatrical household and growing up like with surrounded by art and theater and music like really made me want to pursue it was the camp number one for parents or was that like their hobby from their day job oh yeah that wasn't their main job that was um that was like something that they put on at churches and it wasn't really for like a lot of money it was more for like their own kids basically so were their day jobs even connected to entertainment or no at all? Okay, oh yeah. so this, well my mom like is an artist okay um but like a visual artist okay um so she does pen and ink and stuff and and my dad grew up doing theater as well but never pursued it as a career so sure, they were yeah. like putting their you know their love into that um oh, i love that yeah okay so after so and i also grew up like <clears throat> one of my sister's was really really into theater but they obviously did it um and i remember there were like two children's theaters in annapolis but you had to be eight years old to do the shows so i was like counting down the years i would go to my sister's like rehearsals and cast parties and stuff i just wanted to be in shows so bad and then finally when i was eight years old i was old enough to be in charlotte's web and i played avery so that was my first show ever it was so fun um and then i was homeschooled and then we moved to North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, And luckily in Wilmington, there's like 15 community theaters there. There's so much there. There weren't any professional like regional theaters there, but there were so many opportunities like children's theaters and older community theaters and shows at schools and stuff. So that really definitely like 
Mm. helped cultivate i was able to do shows pretty much year round if i wanted to and if i was able to was there a defining moment at that age or did that not come until like high school mid high school like when, when i was decided, like i want to do this yeah <clears throat> i think i always knew that i wanted to be in theater um it wasn't till i was 16 i was doing hairspray and my director ray kennedy who runs um kennedy entertainment in new york and he which does like all of the uso shows um and all of those things um he um came into town to do the show and he was the first person that like told my parents like if your son really wants to do this as a career he he can like he can do it and if he got like auditions for schools and you know we he opened up this whole world that we were like oh this is like a possibility um and even so like when i was applying to schools my parents made me apply to mostly academic schools and we did like three um like musical theater programs um so that we were very um that was very risky doing that but um <laughs> we didn't know at the time how risky it was yeah. we like but um but yeah so this is applying for college mm -hmm. and you'd had to apply for mm -hmm. like three real schools and then three dream schools. well yeah <laughs> the, word it like exactly that. like three academic three performing arts because it's like really expensive and time oh, yeah. consuming everyone knows to go to all these college auditions yeah. and we didn't know that like oh you're supposed to audition for like 10 mm. because you it's very hard to get into um okay yeah, yeah. so speaking <laughs> of getting hard uh, getting hard 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 to get into <laughs> freudian slip um <laughs> let's put a pin in the story of your life for a second and mm -hmm. talk about auditioning for colleges okay uh you graduated in what year 2017. Okay. I graduated in 2014. Mm -hmm. And when applying to theater arts colleges, there was no, at least the one I went to, did not have a pre-screening process. Now it right. does. Was there a pre-screening process when you auditioned? There was, but not for the schools I applied to. Okay. And now it seems like most colleges have that. Yes. So the people that are getting in mm -hmm. are finding the right people to record their stuff at a high mm -hmm. quality. And it's just so much, it's a more, I guess it weeds through the selection process. Right. Well, because when I auditioned for college and, and I was the assistant to the head of my program at Elon. Yeah. So I did a lot of number crunching and, um, since the audition process has changed and she actually didn't want to do pre-screens in the first place because she's like, I want to feel their like heart and soul when I meet them. This is, the head of our program at Elon, Kathy. Kathy. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, and she was, she really was against it because she was for that exact reason. She's like, a lot of these kids are going to look better or worse because of how professional quality things are. But she was like, I simply like the audition days for Elon would fill up so fast. And she's like, it's even worse because there's a lot of people that we won't even get to see because they didn't sign up. Uh, in in the first week and so when i auditioned for elon i think there were like 300 350 people auditioning and this past year there were over 1100 videos submitted they invited like 300 to campus and then had a class of 20 25 what was your class um our class was 20 19, 19. people yeah it's usually yeah it's small but yeah See, huh. that's insane. I know. And that's the other thing that I, I find when I do like, you know, because we wear many hats in the city. So mm -hmm. you, you can find yourself on both sides of the table, so to speak, when you're auditioning. Yes. And a big running theme are people not looking like their uh, headshots. Yeah. Look like your headshot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's definitely important. <laughs> I mean, whoever's listening. But that's like, that's the kind of thing when you do these self tapes, you know, it's obviously mm. your best your literal best quality of your performance yeah, and may not always be, you know, you want the person in the moment, really what they're doing, not a whole doctored for sure. For sure. Thing. Yeah. Anyway. So it definitely adds a whole nother layer and yeah. yeah and, and a whole nother layer of expenses too. Yeah. Um, so okay. So expenses. you got, okay. So you get to college mm -hmm. and your, was there a few, were you deciding between a few or was this um, a pretty obvious choice? Honestly, for you? Elon was like the only performing arts school that I got into um it was kind of I felt really lucky to get into and and I only knew about it how many did you audition for three okay yeah and Elon was the one okay yeah and so um yeah and some of the other ones are funny to me like to laugh at thinking if I had gone there um but you know what I mean like we end up like where we're supposed to be for we sure end up where we're supposed that to be. is always the truth of college auditions but um but yeah, so I had met 
two alums from Elon that I did theater with one summer. I did shows with, um, and that was the first I'd heard of it. Um, and they, you know, had already graduated and everything. So, um, that was kind of how I found out about that school. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm so happy I went there. It was amazing. Yeah. What was your question again? I don't even remember. We're, just, <laughs> we're moving right along here. I love it. That's right. We just we're just rocking and rolling. So let's fast forward a little bit. Mm-hmm. I I'm a fan of like audition stories. Uh huh. So I'd love to hear yours. Yes. And yeah. So take it away. Yes. So basically, my audition story with Book of Mormon was very. It kind of was felt like a Cinderella story in in that moment. Like it was just like crazy how it all happened but um basically I met one of the casting directors like associates when he came to Elon my senior year um and he submitted me um for the show um so I sent a video submission as well as like there were five or six other people in my class that all submitted the same stuff and it was a bunch of sides and things from the show so um I got a call back for the show Um, that ended up being basically a day after graduation. So I graduated on a Saturday in May and then literally, quite literally did a toe touch across the stage when I got my diploma, um, in true fashion. But, um, and then, uh, the next day on the Sunday packed up my like car, like packed up my whole apartment and drove to the Raleigh airport and, and got to New York. And then my audition was Monday morning. Um, and so this was, like I guess a final callback but I didn't know till I was there but me and all my classmates as well like there were five or six of us who all went too um and so yeah we went and did all the material and everything um and just made it through you know the cuts of the day um down to like three or four people um and basically that night the head of my program Kathy was like did you audition for Carrie Gardner and I was like yeah I did and she was like well she just reached out to me like I can't say why and I was like well you can't like that totally was like a tease you're like I know why (laughs) right but like I was like shooketh um and that night my agents reached out to me and were like you basically got it but they're waiting for like one person to approve you and um I'm guessing that was Casey Nicola because it was like, you know, they had to approve via video. Oh, yeah. um, so anyway, I was just like, this is crazy. And I found out um, the next day. To, and, th- and then my agents were like, if you get this, you'll be starting rehearsals tomorrow at three o'clock learning music at the theater. And I was like, OK, like because I like had a whole you know, a bunch of summer jobs lined up. Like I wasn't planning on moving to the city for months. And yeah. like I was just like that was crazy to me. And, um, the next day I actually still went to an audition for, it was for Charlie and the chocolate factory. It was for like an immediate replacement. And I went to that dance call cause obviously I didn't know if I got the job or not. Um, yeah, but, um, I literally like just butchered it like in the worst way. And it was not good. I got cut and I was like, wow. And I literally left the audition and had a voicemail for my agents and called them and they were like, you got it, you start today. And I I just thought that was really funny that like I had just gotten cut from something and um, that I was just truly not right for and it wasn't my show. But like yeah. I got the perfect opportunity and perfect show for me. Um, and I found out from the head of my program that they had asked her like, because they were like, a swing position is a big deal. Like, can we trust JJ, like, is he capable of doing this because this is a really big deal and he's a baby, basically. Um, And she was like, and I was, like I said, the head of my program's assistant. And I literally helped run, like, her life, the program, like, audition days, casting director days, like, helped do so much. And she was like, I can guarantee you, like, he will show up first day with everything color-coded, like, all of his notes and orders. Um, And so, like, and I did. I, like... You know, it was like, okay, now I have to really live up to that because she spoke on my behalf. But mm. that was like a true testament to like the work ethic that you put in even at school or something um, just really like can pay off and really can like benefit you in the future, especially with something like swinging. Did you volunteer to help Kathy? I basically did. I mean, obviously it was a paid position, but oh, I, sweet. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Okay. It was like a student, you know, a student like, worker assistant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, but I also just like love administrative things. I was a business minor in school and like, I love, um, doing that kind of stuff. So I 
just like was really passionate about it. Um, so I would have done it for free probably too. Were you, when you were helping her out, were there moments where you were not living up to the needs of the job or are you, have you always been highlight (laughs) post-its, you know, notes? I think there's definitely been mistakes I've made. If anything, a mistake I make is being like too quick and tenacious, like in the sense of, um, sometimes you need to take a minute and you can't like just go ahead and do something before you know what you're doing. Like I just get so excited about projects that I'll just like do it and then like mess up and do it wrong or, um, end up like releasing information or things that I like early that I shouldn't be releasing just cause I'm excited about it. Oh yeah. So that's the mistake that I make. I think it's just interesting because your reputation with her and like essentially what she said, you know, about Mm -hmm. you to the casting team, um, that might that I don't know you tell me if I'm wrong was not always a conscious effort did you always show up to assist her with this like she's going to review me at some point to someone I need to have a good reputation that's why I'm doing this job perfectly (laughs) or is that just like I like honestly the thing is they always say like oh like make sure you do a good job at all your shows and every place you work because they will act as references and I've always I have always but not in college college is where you mess up (laughs) and I was like a casting director is asking the head of my program like to me like I just didn't think that would happen so honestly that was not my mentality at all but I always operate by the mentality of like you need to be on your best behavior at all times you need to be putting in the work you need to be like doing your absolute best in everything yeah my parents always taught me to like really strive for that yeah no and I think that's so interesting because the the, not the reason you got the you got the job because you're talented, but one of the main reasons mm-hmm. along with that is that you had a reference mm-hmm. of of, of my stature, organizational of, skills. Yes, yeah. which they needed to know that I could do because it's so for seven it's tracks. It's almost unbelievable how often you see people like someone leaves the room, they're great, and then it's like onto Facebook. Who do I know? Who knows? Oh my gosh! Who knows? For real? I'm not casting real, anything. That's not what I've done. I'm just saying, <laughs> it's incredible. They look, yeah, because it's all they the do. information is like. Right at the fingertips. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Okay, so now you book this job Mm -hmm. about a week. (laughs) This was two days after graduation. Two days after graduation. Yes. And we don't have to to spend too much time on the logistics. I'm assuming you went home, got some stuff, came back. Well, no. (laughs) Like, I literally had a tiny suitcase with, like, nothing with me. I luckily was staying with a friend's parents, but I had to, like, find a sublet and... Also happened to have my credit card stolen the same day. Like, so I didn't have like money, (laughs) Um, but I had to like figure all this out. And they did give me one day off, like two weeks later to go home and get all my stuff um, and, and like pack and everything. Because all this while my car was still at the airport with my entire apartment in it. So I had to like ship my parents, my keys home so that they could drive two hours to the airport in separate cars, you know what I mean? Or like drive together so they could drive back my car separately with all my stuff in it. And like, it was just like crazy. But like I said, it was like a Cinderella story moment. But honestly, I kind of felt a little bit like a lost puppy, like in, in a good way, kind of. But I was just like a hot mess. Like there was no transitional period after graduation. So I was like, I don't know how to swing. I've never done it, let alone like, rehearse for a Broadway show, let alone figure out how to live in New York and what I'm doing here. Did you figure it all out yourself or did you have swing mentors? Um, I did. Thank God our, our dance captain for Book of Mormon is great. Um, and I did reach out to a few friends being like, how do you organize it all? And I wasn't worried about my organizational skills. I was more worried about like picking the right way to do it for myself that w- would help me keep everything like in my brain easiest. What did you figure out? So what I ended up, I ended up doing my color coding. So each track I have, um, each track, each track I cover, I have a different color for. So like one track will be like the blue track. And so I have, you know, at first I just took down all my notes and then once I had learned it all, I condensed them into note cards. And so each one has like a stack of like 10 note cards that I, I keep with me at all times that I can just flip through. And then I have one main stack of note cards that I have all of the formations of the show drawn out in the dimensions and the numbers that they're all on. And each track is a certain color. So I just follow what that person does. And to be honest, like I have a really, I think I have a much better short term memory than long term. I think that 
if I, you know, getting thrown on last minute, I'm able to do it, but it's really stressful. And I always like to review my notes before I go on. What do you put on each card? Is that scene? Like one card is a scene? It'll be like Dance number? a reminder of lines or like you go behind this person. It'll be like really small things. I don't have to review any of the vocal tracking or solos really but anymore. But when you have each card listed... Mm -hmm is like one card has act one, scene one. The second card is act Oh, right. One, it's scene like scene two. by scene. That's how you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Number by number. Yeah. Okay. Have you gone on for all the tracks? I have. I did that like in my first four or five months. Did you have, and I, I don't usually like to have these like juicy gossip moments, but yeah. I'm just so curious. Were you ever on stage in like blue track and started to do red track? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, it hasn't it's happened. It's like a fear of mine if I'm learning multiple tracks. Oh, 100%. <laughs> or like in the number, in the opening number, is yeah. honestly like the most nerve wracking because it's just solo, 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 jump around, jump around, jump yeah. around. And it's like trying to follow the one vocal track that you know, even like the hello, 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 you know, like yeah. keeping track of like which one you're singing. And so you, yeah. there definitely has been one or two times that thank God, like they're good about turning the mics on and off. Yeah. But like I've said, I've said someone else's like lines, like, during hello oh, yeah. you, like they're solo right, right, um right. and things like that and there have been some crazy stories just with like costume malfunctions and that's a typical thing that like as a swing you know we have our own set of wigs costumes hair everything you know mm. and so sometimes it'll be like someone else's stuff and you just have to like go with it because it's mm. accidentally mm. someone else's like costume piece yeah. and and then it's a human you know. error of live theater oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah but there have been i mean Swing anxiety is real, and so um, I've had to like deal with that. But luckily, I don't I don't suffer from like crazy anxiety of any type. But I definitely think swinging is not for the faint of heart because you're um, you get really worked up when you go on for sure. Yeah, it's that adrenaline. Yeah, I had an interesting conversation with Andrea Burns a while back, and she mm -hmm. had brought up how great it is when you're stepping in to a higher you know we do like community theater we do regional theater we do broadway mm -hmm. we do off broadway we do television film all that stuff and when you're stepping into you know like that next tier you know like going to broadway your first broadway show so to speak mm -hmm. it's great to be like the understudy of someone because yes. you can just kind of witness human mm. communication mm -hmm. at that level in that community of theater yes. and then find your you know, your speed, the beat of your drum or what have you within yes. that community. I'm curious uh, because you were understudying, but not so much. You're like literally the, the emergency big band aid for right, <laughs> right. all tracks. What were, what did you learn about like the human communication and finding your place? Like in terms of backstage or like on stage, like in, well, let's in start the show. on stage. Okay. And then we'll go backstage. Yeah. I would say, um, it definitely, I think, I had I had to learn really to not be so hard on myself um, in terms of like because people are just trying to help you on stage you know um, and and there is no way that you're gonna go on as a swing or an understudy and not f flub one little thing or even like a backstage like traffic pattern or quick change. I had to learn to like not be so hard on myself because you know I I think a lot of us performers are and you can't like if you mess up one little thing that no one really noticed, like you can't go backstage and cry about it. And like, I would do that. Like I, I would want to do that. I would say, um, just because I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm messing this all up. Or sometimes people will be like, Oh, oh, oh like stand here. Or like, you know what I mean? And like the kind of phrase shove with love is very real. Yeah. And so I just had to realize that people were trying to help me and be there for me instead of being like, Oh, I'm in their way. You know what I mean? Because there's there, it's inevitable that you're, the the place that you stand or the or the traffic pattern or like the way that you deliver a line is going to be a tiny bit different than someone else and that difference is good like people love when swings go on actually at least in my building and it's like a breath of fresh air i think for them and even you know um the heads in my building you know the production mm. managers and stuff have said that just because it's like it adds it sh shifts the energy mm. so i had to remember that like i don't need to be a carbon exact copy of everyone as long as i'm doing my job really well and not in any way and and doing all the traffic patterns but like it's okay to put my own little bit of flair on it or like you know like that's a good thing and shifting of the energy um so that's de definitely something in terms of like communication, but like everybody in our building is so great. And honestly, it was really nice to go into a show like Book of Mormon. That's a well-oiled machine 
because everything was set. Like there was no room for them to be like, oh, we're actually changing this now. You know what I mean? It was like, this is what you do. Um, and I'm, I work really well with like being, having really clear direction. So that was good. Okay. Okay. So then moving backstage in terms of just finding your place, mm -hmm. you know, finding your, your energy, I guess mm -hmm. what you, what you bring back there, were there lessons learned or things Definitely. that stand out in your mind? Definitely. I mean, like that you I want to share. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, like I said, when I came to the city, like I was kind of like a lost puppy and and was trying to really find my footing. Um, and and the transition of going from like running everything at school and being the head of everything and being a senior like it's that, you know, like, you know, that that's how it is. Yeah. Um, and. I um and then going right to being like a small fish in a big pond and like New York City is so overwhelming and so intimidating. Um and so you know translating to Book of Mormon being backstage with people who had all been in the business for a while and me being by far the youngest in the cast was like definitely like I feel like I I wasn't very grounded if I'm being honest. I think that like I that that took me some time to find that for myself and and be really like grounded so grounded meaning just like being like sure of myself and confident and like knowing who I am because I feel like in every phase of life like when your life changes so drastically like that like you you kind of have to figure out who you are in a different way and I had to figure out who I was like fitting into this this mold and fitting into this environment that I had never been in and figuring out how to like be the best me in that environment. You know what I mean? But it definitely was intimidating. And like, I will say like there were some hard days and you know, that's the, the truth of, you know, you only post your highlight reel on social media. And so for anybody it's looking true. from the outside, I'm sure they were like, he's living the dream. Like this is a dream come true. And like I said, like it kind of was like a little bit of like a Cinderella story. Like it was, it was crazy the way that it happened and how quickly I, I got my like quote unquote big break, but like yeah. all the while, like, especially my first six months, I just felt like super lost and like, like as a person, cause I wasn't like nurturing anything of myself. I wasn't catering to like my spirit and to myself because my life was this new job that I had. And I think that that definitely, and listening to some of the other podcasts of the people coming on and talking, like, that's a big no-no. Like, that's a dangerous place to be in where, like, the business and your career becomes all that you are. And I think, to me, that was just, I was just overwhelmed with everything, and I didn't have much time to myself. I was always rehearsing. I was always, like, Book of Mormon was my life. Um, and I moved here for that. I didn't move here for me and then got that. So it was just... Um, yeah, it was a crazy situation, but I definitely think that over time I like, I, and, and I expressed this a little bit to you earlier before we got on the record, but I definitely, um, started, I feel like I, uh, parts of me were shutting down. Um, and I feel like over the past few months I've been letting those open again because there were times that like I came to realization that I was like, I've been seeing my vulnerability and sensitivity and emotional um, nature as a weakness instead of a strength. And I um, started allowing myself to like, I, I was just kind of, I, I tore down myself. Um, and it, it was partially because of the environment I was in, just because people were really confident and really sure of themselves. And I was so scared to like speak, like I was scared of, uh, to be in this new environment. Um, and, and really scared to be myself, to be honest. And so I started shutting off parts of myself and like, I came to realization that I was like, I don't think I've like let myself cry in a year. And, and I, I saw parts of my life and my art, like suffering because of it, like auditions not going as well because of that, or like, you know, because I was not allowing myself to feel so deeply. And I feel like I started to become a little more uninspired or started, you know, just because of um, shutting off those parts of myself. What was the moment where you realized that you were like becoming emotionally numb? Was there a moment in time and yeah. what did you do to open yourself up specifically? Yeah. Was this writing, communication with friends? Um, definitely all of the above. Okay. Um, but I, I think 
it was it was definitely after one like tough like rough audition that okay. didn't go super well and also um i think i i made the mistake which if you're listening do not make this mistake of my first you know because i was like i'm in a broadway show i didn't um work on my art a lot like I wasn't taking acting classes I wasn't taking voice lessons I wasn't I took a few dance classes here and there but I wasn't like working on all the stuff outside um that I needed to because obviously if you're in a show you're only using a specific skill set so there's all these other parts of yourself that you're not using and it gets easier right (laughs) the one skill set Exactly. It, I mean, you know, removing backflips and what have you from the equation. right. <laughs> but like the muscle memory for here. me, like yeah. singing became like uh, singing became a chore versus like what I love to do. My way of expression. I I wasn't writing songs as much. I wasn't journaling as much. I wasn't like allowing myself to do that. And once I, I it's silly, but when I got back into voice lessons, like singing for myself again and singing things that I love and like just becoming re-inspired. And, and to me also like just even watching certain movies, I would realize that like I would prevent myself from crying because I, which before I used to just, and I've always been a heart on my sleeve, open book, open vulnerable person. Um, and there were, and to be honest, there were some relationships like friendships wise in my life that I think, I started training my brain that like, if I'm around these people, I can't be this open, vulnerable person. I can't be who I am because it's dangerous. It's, it's, um, uh, I'm opening myself up to being picked on. I'm opening myself up to being hurt, being hurt and sarcasm. And like, there's just certain, and, and I just had to like, honestly take a step back from certain friendships and relationships. And I think that's important to know when you need to do that. Um, and, and I really operate, Um, the way that I, uh, like uh, the way that I go through things and, and recover and what I, whatnot is by talking about them is by talking. And I needed, and, and once I started, you know, talking to my friends about it and specifically like my parents and I like really trust them and like allowing myself to just have one or two breakdown moments that I was like, I don't have everything together and I don't like, and that's okay. Like. I just had to allow myself to have those like breakthroughs and just have a good cry. And, and I feel like every aspect of my life I'm looking at in a different light now and like looking at my vulnerability and sensitivity as a positive, as an artist, like going into an audition and bearing your soul and opening yourself up. And I'm like, that's why I got a job like Book of Mormon in the first place. Like that's what they were drawn to was my personality and who I am. So, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that yeah, was like a long-winded answer, but yes. No, 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 no. It wasn't definitely wasn't long-winded. I'm curious about your artistic outlets, mm-hmm. the things that allow you to express yourself, like outside of my show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, because yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and yeah. What are they? Definitely, I've always loved songwriting, and that is something I did before, like even when I had just gotten started in theater, I always was writing songs. So I, you know, took some piano and, um, when I was in college, so I know like basic piano, but I really play guitar and ukulele. And so just like sitting and like writing songs or making covers and like producing music for me, that's a big thing. I would say obviously going to dance classes and like training myself is great and like I've been really pushing myself to work on styles that I've never done because even in musical theater school you only do a few styles like and so I've been pushing myself to do more stuff of like contemporary and hip-hop and stuff like that that I've I didn't even realize how much I love and how suited my body is for that more so than like something like Fosse that I used to think that I was like that's my thing and now I'm like no like I mean it, it still is something that I love to do but um so discovering new art in that way oh is that all of them um and and doing my own dance classes (laughs) yeah i mean and and now starting we're going to talk about the dance classes too as we get further down the line amazing i bring up this artistic outlet because i find that as myself i'll speak for myself that 
as a performer, you usually, you know, say for in college, when I was in college, you know, you go to rehearsal, you go to class, you go home, you get on Netflix. Here <laughs> it's you go to auditions, you go to your day job, you get home, you go on Netflix. You go to your show, you get home, you go on Netflix. Not just Netflix, yeah. it's be Hulu, Amazon or whatever. Right. But it's those it's those kind of like it almost or an Instagram, which is like even worse. Hello. It, because it's not like there's no story. <laughs> right. You know, there's no lesson to be learned. And you're essentially watching falsifications just appear of course. you know what I mean and then we do it ourselves because that's what you want to do for people and to have this artistic outlet for yourself whether or not you share it with anyone mm. can have you grow mm -hmm. as a human yes like besides the whole artist thing as a human yes contributing to earth <laughs> for this moment we're here Absolutely. it's really important to have that and that's, that's not why... for and also like something like that that's not for show like not doing it just so you can post about for it for a reward right not likes. taking a dance class or yeah. making a cover of a ukulele like that's something i've really had to check myself on and work on because i'm like i can't just i mean we're, our generation is so results oriented and results based yeah. that you like want instant results like you want the instant gratification instant likes instant comments from people this is amazing yeah. and you do have to like check yourself a little bit and make sure that you're doing it yeah for you and that you're not posting about everything and that like, yeah. What have you learned about <laughs> cultivating your mm -hmm. like, and let's just talk about Instagram for a mm -hmm. second, Instagram page. Was it uh, like all over the place and now it's focused? Do you pay much attention to it? I Is there like lessons you're trying to slip in there, mm -hmm. you know, for people who look up to you? I definitely should do that more in terms of making it a little more meaningful and lessons. And I'm always inspired by people who who do that and, and don't use it just for their own like self promotion and their own highlight reel. You know, what's so funny is that now I find people doing the, you know, the genuine vulnerable thing, but it's for self promotion and you right. can read, it can get really, you can read in the thing, you know, you read it and you're like, okay, they're being vulnerable, but, but are they being vulnerable or is that being vulnerable for likes? You know, you could smell it. Right. Like you could smell it when it's like someone's really sharing something or someone's like straight up just trying to. Cause if like. every time you, post it's like paragraphs and paragraphs of a novel like that's a little bit crying out for attention to me um unless it's like some poetic like amazing you know what I mean um but yeah I think Instagram is very interesting and it's such become such a tool for our business and I'm not gonna lie like I totally use it as a tool because I use like I'm using it for promotion for like me putting up my art and like putting out like stuff of like my own choreography. Like I think it's important. And I do think there is an aspect of it that is kind of branding. And like, I've 100%. always, it's yeah. bigger than your, e your follower. You, I mean, I don't know what your email list looks like, but like <laughs> my follower list is bigger than my email. list. Hello. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and well, like, that's your email. If you're going to have people come to right. you for something. And, um, yeah. And so also my parents have always been super on my case about, really being careful about my presence and they'll sometimes message me and be like, Mine now, too. Now. I mean, and rightfully so. Like, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm like, no, I'm not deleting that, but sometimes they're, you know, they're right about it. And, um, you know, when I was in college, like I used to like post pictures just like in my costumes at parties and stuff. And granted, I think that I've become a lot more tame moving to New York because I've had to be for my voice and my like art. Like I can't be like, living my best life all the time going out mm. but at school like I totally just posted for fun like and when I was in school I mean Instagram already was a thing and was big but people weren't using it in the way that they are now yeah it was just like for fun it wasn't for branding no but it's become it I don't know if any if you've seen based on when this episode comes out I'm sure it'll still be on Netflix fire festival <laughs> I haven't the watched a documentary you got to check it out yeah it's the use of social media Oh. And the power of social media with just having a quote unquote influencer mm. post uh, orange square. What sort of <laughs> that was like the branding for it, it was what can do to um, a movement. So it's really you should just check it out. I don't really want to talk about it too much because right. I don't want to give it away. I want people to go see it. Of course. There's also one on Hulu equally great. Uh -huh. um, I think I might like the Netflix one a little bit more, but they're equally great. And it's just this realization you need to have with not you in particular, but people should have with the power of the social media because mm -hmm. it used to be a, a play thing. Oh yeah. But when you are your brand, 
you know, it's different if you're, you know, Karen working in HR at a company. It's like you don't have to worry about your brand on Instagram. Right. But if you're literally in the public eye, that's important. Yeah. Every aspect of everything you post. Mm-hmm. And that's why I asked that question. For sure. And, and 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 knowing that like there are a lot of people also that will just like that will come to Book of Mormon and I meet them at the stage door and they're like, "Oh, I follow you." Like they know who I am. And that's really cool and I definitely have gotten a lot of followers from the show. But I also like have noticed, you know, if I l- look at any of my followers pages, like there are a lot of kids from Elon that follow me, like a lot of the underclassmen, a lot of kids from even my Christian high school that I went, my like private high school that are like, I want to be on Broadway. And like, I definitely like there is a sense of like you have a little bit of responsibility to be responsible with what you have, like to use yeah. it f- in an uplifting way and use it in a smart way. Um so I definitely try to do that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Instead of just shameless self-promotion. But a little bit of that never hurt anybody, too. So. Well, I mean, how is anyone <laughs> going to know what you're doing? Right. <laughs> but it's also keeping it genuine. I know it's such a funny thing because there's so it's so things trend, as you know, mm-hmm. you know, like things in life trend. And the one that seems yeah, it just appears to me to be trending a lot is like that genuine self-help spiritual. Right. Which happens to be what our conversation is about. And a lot of my other conversations mm-hmm. are about. But that's. You know, you can smell the difference, though. Yes. You can smell it. Um, Okay. So moving on, moving along here, um, stagnant. Mm -hmm. We all feel it. Yes. At different points in our life. And and I've just witnessed conversations with other people that have been in Broadway shows for a long time. When they mention that they feel stagnant, anyone at the table who's not in a show in New York... It has this kind of, it's like almost, especially if they've been having a few drinks, there's like an immediate face shift. Like, how dare you? What are you talking about? Right. You're not allowed to feel stagnant. Mm -hmm. You're on Broadway. (laughs) That's not an emotion you're allowed to feel. Right. (laughs) Uh, But you are allowed to feel it. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I'm here to tell you, JJ, you're allowed to feel it. (laughs) What, yeah, what, so what, how navigating those feelings? Keeping it fresh, you know, on stage. Mm -hmm. And then what are you doing to minimize the feeling of stagnation? I, yeah, I definitely, I mean, there are days <laughs> that it does feel that way. And I think that as it will, I feel very thankful to be a swing and some people don't like swinging. I love it. Obviously I definitely want to do other things. Definitely keeps it different. But it keeps it different. <laughs> like every time I go on, if I'm on for three different tracks in one week and, and I will say Book of Mormon, I go on a lot. There is, ri- there's probably been only two or three weeks in my whole year and a half of being there that I have not been on once in that week, which I know for other Broadway shows, people swings can go months without being on, especially when they like are just, um, the show's just starting. So I feel extremely lucky and like, it's so fun, like as a swing to get to, um, interact with different people when you're on for different tracks, like you are next to or pass by different people. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Like, I just love seeing different people. I love having different costumes. Like it keeps it fresh, keeps my mind alert, but, on those weeks or specifically like five show weekends, if I'm not on, I'm like, holy crap. Like I'm just sitting around. What am I doing with my life? And I know that's so silly and I'm getting paid amazingly to do it, Mm. but I'm like, I don't want to be sitting. Like I want to be performing. And that's like the typical like swing. I mean, that's like such a typical, like grass is always greener because people who are on eight shows a week, I'm sure would love like having one or two shows off in that week that they didn't have to perform because it's exhausting. Mm. Um, But definitely in terms of being stagnant, I mean, uh, it hit me not quickly, but I will say probably six months in um, once I had mastered all my tracks and there wasn't anything left to learn. uh, Right. Master all that. Okay. But like it, it's, I'm such like, I'm sure you can tell from talking to me, but I'm so like, <clears throat> need to be organizing something, being doing something administrative, learning. I always need to be learning. Mm. And so being someone who was in show to show to show at school, show to show to show at summer stock and had never done anything for more than a month, mm. like doing a, one show for six months, little and now a year and a half is just like crazy. Mm. And I think for, uh, for people who are like getting drinks and, and someone who has that, how dare you attitude towards someone on Broadway being stagnant, like, if they haven't done it, like they have not been there. So like, you don't know until you're there, like how it's going to feel because I think there's very few performers who are complacent and are like, I'm cool being in this show for seven, eight years. 
there are those people though. And I work with some of those people and that's great. If they're like, I have kids, I have a family. I'm so happy to have this stable job. Yeah. yeah. Um, but well, then, cause then you need that. You need that steady income. You need it. You're, you're, you're but for a 23 year old for a child, I'm like, it's crazy right. for me. And right. so I've had to, I just instantly just have combated that stagnation, always working on something. Like when I started to feel stagnant, I, organized a, a charity benefit concert for covenant house last April. And that was like so much work, but it was so much work, like in a good way. Like I loved organizing it and that like, I was like meeting people and I always, I mean, it sucks because you aren't necessarily always in control of like how many auditions you're going to the opportunities, like don't always present themselves. However, like it's really fun when you're auditioning to be able to work towards stuff like that. And to me, I've been able to, instead of looking at it like, oh, why am I like still doing the same show a year and a half later? I'm looking at it more as like, I have a stable income. I get to do everything I love to do because like my life is chill and stable. Like I have a government job right now. Like mm. I tech, so I'm on a four week out. So I technically, unless I get fired for being bad, yeah. I have this job until I, 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 until the show closes, yeah. um, essentially. And so I'm able to like, be like, wow, I'm going to choreograph things. I'm going to teach my dance classes. When did and that begin? How long ago that, did that started, begin? um, in August of this past year. So like right. six months ago. Okay. And I haven't honestly done it as much as I wanted to because other stuff has come up. Like I, I spent one month doing a workshop and like, that was amazing. Um, but I've, I've done like three or four classes now. And, and like I said, like I'm learning this whole area of like contemporary and hip hop, which is becoming so prevalent in musical theater. And I find myself actually doing a lot of auditions for that style, which I'm very happy about. Mm. Um, but I, I, it's getting, it's getting me to push my boundaries. I get to work on warm ups and stretches and like create a class. And so I'm not even doing it for money and I'm lucky that I don't have to do it for the money. Yeah. Um, I'm just, you know, having people cover the room cost, but it's really fun. And I'm getting to meet so many fun people and put up my, you know, all of my, um, I, I just burped into the mic. Well, um, <laughs> nice but, and personal yes, conversation. Exactly. Here. But put up all of your, yeah, my, my art, my choreography. Yeah. And, and, and to me also, I'm looking at that as like, I want to, be a dance captain and a assistant or associate choreographer and eventually a choreographer director. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like, I'm, I'm working on those skills now. And I did at Elon, like I did so much choreography and stuff for all of our student run shows. Like always. I'm just curious. Where do you begin with that? With choreography? Um, like for someone listening. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. So like logistically, or like, how do I yeah. choreograph a combo? Well, yeah, that was my, yeah. Oh, so I mean, to be honest, I wait until, and this is cause I don't, you know, I'm not working at BDC having to create a combo every week, right. but I, I wait until inspiration hits me a little bit and I do seek it out in a way, but like when music, like there is some, I love music and I'm sure, I mean, everybody does, especially if you're in theater arts but like your favorite genres oh it depends on my mood i yeah. i love some trashy pop like honestly yeah. like <laughs> i love just like bubblegum pop r&b yeah. all of that um and i also but then i also really love like alternative like lana del rey like artists like that that are like super like weird and artsy and you know all okay. of that yeah. i hate using that word artsy but um but yeah, I mean, I love like, I'll just hear a song and I, I'm always seeking out new music on Spotify. Like I'm searching for it. Um, and I'm someone who I don't really listen to a lot of musical theater. That was something that hindered me in college because we were taking classes like musical theater history. And I was like, what? Like, I don't know who any of these people are, right. but like, I, I, I just enjoy listening to not musical theater. <laughs> no, I mean that uh, like classical music for me has oh, gone yes. up. So like usually I'm either like it's a podcast or classical music when I'm moving I around love the that. city because it completely changes what's happening yes. with your other senses. Yes. Like the offensive smells in the subway, <laughs> the offensive <laughs> sights sometimes, or even just the physical interactions yes. that you don't want to get into with people as you're bumping. Right. <laughs> so like on the platform, me, so, yeah. on, on my way to an audition or something, Thing, or even just like like I said when I'm seeking out music to like choreograph to like I will find myself just like living my best life on the subway which is the last place that anybody would but like I literally sometimes like skip off of the subway platform because I'm like 
just so excited because music just changes my mood. And I love when I find music that I want to choreograph to and I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is giving me life, like so quite does, literally. Does it start with feelings? movements yeah i don't I, I mean it definitely starts with feelings and uh, i always i have to choreograph to like words and lyrics okay and have a story of like where and that's like obviously a typical musical theater choreographer you start with the story sure yeah but it's always like the vibe like i definitely think that the story and the feeling and vibe comes first and then the steps follow and then i like i figure out what fits in whatever song i'm doing okay. um but i really like to force myself to not recycle things that I've used because I definitely did that at school when we had like, we had, you know, showcases and stuff at school. Did you and, get caught? Oh, oh, I totally <laughs> got caught. I mean, not caught. I mean, actually I, I did because they were like, JJ, these three numbers have the same walking in a circle, like power ballad, musical theater ballad, walking in a circle of 10 people that you <laughs> used last year. Um, or like, you know, people make jokes about certain like choreographic styles, but that's why I'm pushing myself to do, like stuff like hip hop and contemporary that yeah. I haven't done before. And like I said, I'm doing a lot more of that for auditions than like Broadway revival type choreography. Yeah. So it's a trend. It's a trend. And, and I'm really on board. You like, gotta I'm jump here on for that it. boat. Yep. Uh, what is your self talk? What is your self talk regarding positivity? Like, po okay. Um, I definitely think, uh, like I said earlier, that like reminding myself that vulnerability is strength and, um, and I used to look at sometimes going into work or auditions or things like that, like putting my armor on and that is wrong <laughs> as an artist. Like, no, like you cannot view life like that. No. So I'm, I force myself to be open and vulnerable just myself my authentic self and i know that that's like hard to know like what is my authentic self but um, you find it out as you get older yeah but i'm still figuring it out 100 percent. girl I don't know. me too <laughs> uh i'm okay so so you just said something and it completely escaped my mind but um, everyone listening will already know because armor up yeah putting your, your armor up. up but right before that the self-talk of positivity um what was it I said it and I don't even know. No, it was good. It was good. It was so good. But I, well, the whole reason I'm, it's struck. I remember the feeling it gave me, although I don't remember the words. Mm. It was like some Maya Angelou said. The, <laughs> uh, the feeling that it's giving me though, is that you need to have positive, you need to have positivity yes. because you do, anyone gets pissed off, mm. gets let down, mm -hmm. gets upset. And the human like immediate response is survival. Oh my God. And yeah. to survive, you protect. Yeah. To protect, you put on armor, you shut down, you shut up, you remove yes. away. And yes. that's never, sometimes that can be the solution. That can definitely be the solution if you're dealing with someone who's like, just you can't speak to. But not usually is that the solution. You got to communicate. Mm. So I'm curious, uh, mm -hmm. what are your, see, and I lost it again. This is just such a, <laughs> there's so, no, there's so many thoughts I have regarding positivity. What, yeah. ad, what advice do you give, would you give to like a young, like smart driven mm. college student who is going yeah. to refer to is going to face rejection. Oh yeah. And staying positive. Absolutely. I think like you said, like just having a positive outlook on it is really important because I've witnessed people who like look at situations two ways and they always say like glass half full, half empty. But like when you look at auditions, like that is real. Like I think that, and, and this is something that, um, I think we've seen online that was a trend hashtag share your rejection and someone and I did not share mine and um, someone actually posted a status that was like you are looking at it like rejection though and casting directors and agents and people do not want to reject you and they want you to be there. They want you to be the solution to their problem. So you could feel that when you get down to like the final three too. Oh yeah. Because they're like, please work. Their reputation's on the line now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they're like, like please you. be the answer to our prayers. <laughs> yeah. And so to me and, and this has been something that I've been really frustrated with and, and something I did want to share because people think like, Oh, like you're, you're in a Broadway show. So like, like going to auditions isn't hard and it definitely will a, when you're a little out of practice, cause you're not 
actively seeking every and everything and every, anything, it, it is harder um, sometimes to audition because you're out of practice. So, but I've, I've been more in practice lately. Yeah. Um, but it's not, rejection is not any easier even when you have an amazing job like the Book of Mormon. And I think that that's kind of a misconception. Um, it's easier in the sense that like, sometimes I get to leave an audition after being cut and I'm like, well, I didn't get that Broadway show, but I'm going to do mine. Like, that's amazing. I'm getting to do what I love. Like I'm getting to do what I've always wanted to do. So I always try in terms of positive thinking, I always try to think that. And so it definitely is probably harder when you are leaving an audition and you're like, well, now I have to go like do X, Y, Z wait tables, whatever that you don't necessarily love and want to be doing. Um, but Facing rejection is not any easier and um, it's really hard because I've gotten into final callbacks, like you said, like final three people, whatever, for like six or seven like huge things in this past year. And it's really hard when you get so close to something. I'd rather be cut right away than get so close to something sometimes. <laughs> Not for the sense of like, you definitely are meeting people in a different way and like they're learning who yeah, you are. We're talking just selfish reasons right now. Like this selfish has nothing reasons. to do with like making the connections. Cause yeah, it's great to get to the last three. But like, but for yourself, it's so hard because I, there's um, less of a yes, it's like you have given yourself to it a little bit and like, part of me like I start fantasizing about like oh this 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 this, this. <laughs> like an original Broadway cast dreams like that's something definitely on my radar that I would love to do and I've gotten so close so many times however something that I've realized if also from f friends around me auditioning is that you are only going to get what you are absolutely perfect for and I know that that's like so cliche everyone's like well duh but like no like we all think especially in in college when you're like kind of doing shows sometimes that you're not right for or you're doing summer stock a season of four shows like why was I in South Pacific you know what I mean I mean yeah. I, I could be in South Pacific but like to me I'm like that's not a perfect fit by yeah. any means but I fit the other shows yeah. but in terms of like something on the caliber of tour or Broadway like or like workshops and labs which you're getting to like create your own role but you still have to fit you have to be perfect for it but like you really have to be perfect for what you got. And I was a perfect swing for Book of Mormon. Like, I just fit exactly what they needed. I had the range they needed, the age, the look, the skills, and the organizational skills. And it's t taken me a lot of <laughs> rejection, because I have faced a lot of it even while being employed, um, to realize that, like, I wasn't perfect for that. It is hard when you definitely still think like, oh, I was perfect for that and didn't get it, which has happened too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the cards don't line up. You are out of town for a final callback or like miscommunicate, you know, whatever. Um, right. Or just have a bad callback or a bad audition. But like um, you are only going to get what you're perfect for. And I, I've had friends that spent a whole year in the city, you know, trying to fit exactly da 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 like going in for like something like Carol King and like thinking that they need to be a carbon copy replica but like what is going to get you the job is exactly what you do and like I got Book of Mormon having never seen the show and I do believe that part of the reason I got it is because I wasn't trying to be like all of the people in the show I didn't have any conception of like I need to be this like upbeat happy like da da da, -da. I just like was I was just myself and I was perfect for it Versus like trying to fit into a mold of something. Um, so I think that's something I really learned. So I have to just remind myself of that mm -hmm. when I'm going to auditions being like, I just wasn't perfect for that. That wasn't my show. It was my job. If it was meant for me, it wouldn't pass me by. It would happen. So like, I'm just, I'm, I'm ready and open and willing for whatever comes next. But like, I know that it will, if I keep, you know, just working on myself and my skills. Keep on the path. Keep on the path. Absolutely. What are your What are your thoughts, philosophies with goal setting? Do you set goals? What are your goals? One hundred percent. What are you working towards? Are they I monthly, <laughs> yearly, <laughs> decadely? <laughs> right. Well, and like, there's those things like New Year's resolutions that we all set that we know we don't meet. Like, I should read more. There's dry January. What's that? What's that? <laughs> Who's she? Um. But yeah, I mean, I am honestly extremely goal oriented and I think honestly sometimes too much so and at a detrimental to myself because like you can't necessarily live goal to goal to goal to goal like you will never be happy if you can't just be happy with nothing happening in your life yeah. at the moment um which I think performers like we definitely make a mistake of yeah. um sometimes but I think goal setting is extremely important and I have always been like super like 
I always use a planner. Like I'm always like, I, like I said, I'm very organizational minded. So I think setting goals is really important. Um, and for me, like certain things like I, I see in my future, I'm like, I would love to be a dance captain. I would love to cover a role, like tangible things that I could see for myself in the next three or four years. Yeah. Um, and you know, eventually like, not like my end game. Cause there's so many things where my career, like as performers, there's so many facets that we can be using our skills. Oh yeah. But I would love in my dreams, I would love to be like a director, a choreographer, like a big one, like on Broadway. But I would also love to run my own theater company. And I, I, like I said, I, I business minored at school. So I could still see myself on the business side of it because I, I don't see myself at 40 years old performing on a Broadway stage. If I'm being a hundred percent honest, I, really would love to be on the more creative and business side of it by then. Um, but like, there's definitely a lot of goals performance wise that I want to meet before I do that. And obviously like we all have boxes we want to check and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I haven't set like an age limit or like, well, I kind of did. I said 40, but like to me, like there's no, like there really isn't an age limit. And, and to me, there's not like, I need to be a lead on Broadway by 30 years old. Like yeah, I don't like, isn't. I don't care when that happens, but I do want to experience things like that. Um, and getting to play a principal role on Broadway or tour or in any facet. I still haven't done a principal role professionally. I was supposed to, and then I, I couldn't end up doing it because of Book of Mormon. But that's like that's a tangible goal. I'm like, in the next year at a regional theater, I would love to you know, take a, a small leave of absence from the show and do a role that I've always wanted to. Yeah. So... Those kind of things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What are you looking, what are you working on getting better at personally? Mm -hmm. Like I, in, in the arts? In the arts or in yourself? You know what I mean? Like right. I know I should read more. I know I should journal more. <laughs> I know I should meditate. You know, like those things. Yes. What all are, things I should do more. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> Next question. But, right. <laughs> but like as an artist, it, yeah. like I said, I made the mistake of not, um, uh, of kind of being like comfortable in my Broadway show and not um, being tenacious in terms of working towards other skills. And I will say for anyone listening, even if you're singing every day, that doesn't mean you're singing right every day. And I actually went through a, a little bit of a crazy time because I had developed a lot of bad habits vocally singing Book of Mormon, trying to get this like, nee, 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 like pingy, Mormony, screlty sound. I mean, it is the hardest show I've ever sung, hands down. And Stephen Aramis, his vocal arrangements are crazy and they're amazing, but they're crazy. So I, um, yeah. So definitely I developed some bad habits vocally and I am very thankful for my voice teacher. I'm working with Matt Farnsworth in the city and I definitely recommend his studio. Um, but I I've taken now five or six lessons from him over the past like four or five months and like completely changed the way that I sing and have, am singing the show made it so much easier. I was like, why am I making singing the show so hard for myself? Um, and that can get really dangerous. And I think obviously anybody who's ever been in a show singing like book of Mormon or like, people obviously people that are like alpha buzz and stuff like you can get to a dangerous place yeah. you can lose your voice you yeah. can if you're not doing it properly so we always need to be training and yeah. like in dance skills like i was in physical therapy for months like not for any crazy injury but like my like just because of overuse of certain parts of your body that you're doing eight times a week yeah. so like there were like things that i've had to go back into dance class and be like i'm not properly stretching these things yeah um and and that's going to prevent me vocally dance wise acting wise etc if i'm not working on those skills outside of book of mormon like that's all the skills i'm going to use is that tiny part mm -hmm. where i have this whole toolbox of things that i need to be able to do and can do for whatever the next job is um so um, I'm getting my butt back in acting classes too. Like I said, dance classes and choreographing and voice lessons. And it's truly like, I feel myself more inspired just working on it. And that's yeah. just like, you had just have to do it. Um, so those are all just things. That's it. why I'm like, well, part of me is like thankful for this 
like stable job and I'm looking at this not as stagnation. Is that even a word? I don't know. Being I don't stagnant. Know. Uh, stagnation. For this episode, it is. Yes. Hashtag stagnation. Yeah. But um. Uh, but yeah. Like. Be- <laughs> I don't think it's a word. It's not a word. <laughs> uh, but like being stagnant. Yeah. Like I'm not looking at it that way. I'm like, wow, I have this amazing job and I have the finances and ability to and, and all this free time. Honestly, because with Broadway shows, you have a lot of free time. I can use yeah. all of that to like make sure that I'm like the best that I can be mm-hmm. um, and always working towards getting better and learning more about my voice and everything. I'm just curious as we, as we wrap up here, mm-hmm. what like with your time backstage, what are you doing? <laughs> well, for a little while I try to be very um, proactive. <laughs> it's like a loaded question. <laughs> no, no. I try to be very proactive. Okay. Um, I will say I watch a lot of shows. However, I've I've made an effort to um to be watching things that are like I'm gonna learn a lot from like art wise and history wise um instead of just like trash TV that I love because like I love Drag Race it's become my life however I will lose brain cells watching that like I'm not yeah. gonna learn a lot from watching that yeah. so like I've I've been trying to combat that and okay. um. But I definitely like I, I spend a lot of time backstage, like like I said, choreographing. Yeah. I'll be working on stuff for auditions or sides or songs, stuff for concerts that I'm doing or like like when I was organizing that concert, all of those kind of organizational things, emails. And I'm like I'm checking the equity website like I'm always making sure that I know everything that is going on, because if I want to be in for it, I really want to make sure that I can if if, if I'm able to. Yeah. Um Something so, comes yeah. to mind really quick as you mm-hmm. said this, and I f- came across this quote the other day, that a formal education will make you a living, self-education will make you a fortune. Ooh, love and that. it is so freaking true mm-hmm. to keep learning outside of the formal, you know, schooling right. or what have you, like just going to your dance class or like watch videos on dance or even just reading. I mean, there are so many good mm-hmm. books that can teach you so much and we have so, so much, much time in a day that's wasted. Right. With like, I'm know, trying to be better about that or a, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh my gosh. Me too. I'm saying, yeah, like me too. Cause there's so much distraction in, yeah. like you said, like our phones, like games, like oh, yeah. people love their Nintendo switch. I kind of want to get oh, one, yeah. but I'm like, I will, not waste time. I don't want to say that because recreational time is good, but yeah. I need to be learning too. Yeah, it's balanced. I'm pushing myself. Yeah. Um, okay. So it, it, metaphorically speaking, is there a word or a phrase that you would put on a billboard for millions of people to see? I, I definitely think going back to it, like vulnerability is strength. Um, and that is something that I am trying to remember every day yeah. and remind myself. And I think that as actors, act, no, just as people, we really shut ourselves off. Like think about like New Yorkers, like we're, we shut ourselves off so much because we like don't want to be affected by the things around us, but you have to let those things affect you. That's where your inspiration is going to come from. Yeah. That's where the writing those songs or journaling is going to come from. That's where the next dance piece or like, show that someone's going to write like that's where it comes from is allowing yourself to be affected by those things. So I think that's really important (laughs) for sure as people. Vulnerability is strength. Definitely. Wow. JJ, this has been, this has been a great conversation. Uh, is is there anything you want to add on here at the end? Any other tidbits that you want to share with people listening? Hmm. Anything that comes to mind? I definitely think, um, that, Um, it's just important. Like, like we said, it's important to set goals. And I think being tenacious, um, and for anyone listening, especially like people who are young and like just getting started in the business, like being tenacious is good. And like, I would say (laughs) I'm someone that's such a yes man. And like saying yes is yet saying yes to everything is good too. But sometimes you have to know when to say no. Um, but like setting goals and like being tenacious is like going to get you places and like keeping working at what you're doing like is going to pay off but never become a workhorse to the sense that like you don't take time for yourself and that you're not happy in your day-to-day life when zero is going on um and when nothing is happening for you in your career um so just like like i mean obviously it's all about balance but like it's important to like remember that like you are a person first and foremost and your art will come from that. 
um, and your creativity and everything will come from that. But you're a person first. Um, you're not like a performer first. So, yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> this conversation has been great. Where where can we find you on oh, the social media? Oh, the social medias. Um, on Instagram at JJ Neiman. Last name is uh, just JJ N I E M A N N. Um, I have a Twitter, but I don't really use it, so don't follow me. Um, and um, my website is jjneiman.com. Um, yeah, but all my all my stuffs there, my choreography, all of that. This is so great. connect with me. Yes. Yay. JJ, this has been a blast. Thank you for so chatting fun. with me. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, JJ Neiman. Bye. <laughs> You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another Curiosity Conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening.